Okay, it's recording. Good evening, everybody. I'm Maestro Orlando Giovanni. Uh, this is um, our second run at the duties and responsibilities of the local rapier marshal. I'll be sure to get this recording pushed out to all the places where it's important for it to be pushed out. Um, we have uh, joining us tonight, uh, Mira. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and so I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so this is not a warranting class. So we, we don't, we're not, um, you, nobody will walk away with a, with a warranting in their kingdom uh, from this class. This is uh, uh, intended to be a society level class uh, for people that are throwing around the idea of becoming a rapier marshal for their local group to give them an idea of what sorts of things they should expect from that. Um, this is an overview and discussions of the responsibilities of the local rapier marshal. Uh, so I'm not going to go into details about how to inspect people's armor or what the proper um, flex should be on, on a rapier for CNT or anything like that. Uh, those things are, should be discussed in a, in a warranting class uh, given uh, by your local group. Um, primary areas of responsibility that I am going to go over. Um, requirements of the office because we're talking about an officer of a local group, a warranted officer, um, uh, official rapier practices, uh, um, marshal in charge at local events, uh, and reporting requirements. Okay, so some requirements of the office. Um, current membership. You have to have a current membership to be a warranted officer. You have to have a current rapier marshal authorization. Now here's an interesting thing about the rapier marshal authorization. Um, in some kingdoms, Anstior is one of those kingdoms, you can be an authorized rapier marshal without being an authorized rapier combatant. I often call that a, a, a naked martial authorization. And it's, it's neat because for those people that, that for whatever reason they don't, they don't intend to uh, compete or, or play in rapier, but they would like to be an officiating safety officer, so to speak, in uh, the rapier community, uh, this uh, ability to have a rapier martial authorization uh, that doesn't require you to be an authorized rapier fighter is actually a very good thing. So check with your local kingdom on that. Um, you need to be currently warranted um, in the office, which means that in some kingdoms, that means that the crown has literally signed off on a warrant for your um, position as an officer. Uh, in some kingdoms, this only requires that you are on the registry or on the log, a warrants log, uh, for your next level marshal. In Osteora, we have regional marshals who maintain a warranting log uh, that, that goes up to uh, their boss, the Kingdom Rapier Marshal. And so here, uh, to be a warranted marshal, you have to be tracked on their log. Um, some kingdoms will differ. You should check with your local uh, kingdom to make sure that you are properly warranted for the office. Um, you should be familiar with the society and local kingdom rules for fencing combat. And I have the, the link here to the latest fencing marshals handbook, uh, which is as of April, 2020. So it's very new, uh, lots of changes in there. Um, I'm personally a big fan of the new handbook. I think it, it clarifies a lot of problems um, and a lot of um, uh, ambiguity that was introduced in the previous handbook. So you should, you should definitely be very familiar with the handbook and the rules in there, uh, as well as any local kingdom rules. Um, in Anstiora, um, 
the entire set of rapier rules fit on a single page right now today and and so the that's the only changes they have from the society level handbook is about a page worth of changes and they're very minor so official practices this is this is one of the primary the primary responsibilities of the of the rapier marshal um, the the officer stuff is fun but this is really the the primary um, responsibility of the rapier marshal um, at official practices you're responsible for inspecting the field when you show up even though it may be a field uh, or a an indoor space that you use quite frequently um, things change and so you should always inspect the field that your fencers are about to use beforehand and make sure there are no changes to it that there's no potholes that have showed up or other hazards that could harm people trying to fence on that field um, conducting armor inspections so this is very important if you are the local fencing marshal or rapier marshal for your group you need to be able to inspect all of the various weapons that will be used. Now, in Osteora, um, there is a single rapier marshal authorization. And when you have that single rapier marshal authorization, you are expected to be able to inspect and marshal rapier, CNT, and rapier spear as well as tournament and melee versions of all three of those. So there's only one, in Onstiora, there's only one rapier marshal position. This may differ from kingdom to kingdom, and it may differ frequently depending on how often they decide to change their lo the local rules. Um, there's no requirement at the society level that you only have one marshal over all of these things. Onstiora has a single marshal for everything covered in the Society Fencing Marshals Handbook. So um, interesting fact about that. Uh, if you are already a rapier marshal, when the new Society Handbook came out, it introduces uh, the rapier spear as a normal uh, weapon that can be used at practices and in tournaments. Now it still has to be used by agreement because it's a non-standard weapon. So in a tournament, someone can refuse to face the spear, but as a marshal, you are now instantly required to be able to inspect those weapons and to also marshal on a field where the rapier spear is being used. So very important thing to remember. Um, you collect and verify waivers. Um, remember that a blue card uh, is a waiver, but some groups will decide to collect waivers no matter what, and they just use the waiver form as a way to keep track of who showed up. I know at our local practices, we have everybody sign the waiver. We don't, we don't check blue cards at all. We just have everybody sign the waiver, and we just tell everybody that we're treating it as a roster for us to track Got a couple more people came in. Keep track of my participants. Hey guys. Who do we have in? Uh, Nadia, is that you? Who is that? Yeah, that's me. I'm just listening while we have dinner. Oh, okay. Sorry for dropping in late. Hi, Orlando. Hey, how's it going, man? It's going okay. Oh, maybe there's a voice I haven't heard. You know, your voice is so distinctive. <laughs> <laughs> miss you, Orlando. <laughs> I miss you guys, too. I can't wait till we can uh, get out and uh, see each other again in Cross Blades. For uh, sure. And I mean that for both of you guys. You too, Nadia. 
That's right. I'm coming for you. Take on Nadia now. She got shot in the face. She's tougher. <laughs> <laughs> She's, that's, is that how you get tougher? I'm going to yeah, have to do that with right. my novice now. Um, oh, I, her in the face a couple times. You come in through me to do that. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, she's got a car now. She's 17. She might run me over. The uh, Okay, well, hey, welcome, guys. Um, sorry if you were sitting in the waiting room too long. Um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and pick up where I left off. Okay, so... Okay, so... Um, like I said, uh, the blue card counts as a waiver, but some groups will use the, the waiver form as a roster. Um, so very important. Uh, and in case you guys missed, uh, we discussed on con conduct armor inspections, I think is, a, is an important point uh, that now that the, the rapier spear is, is a, an official weapon and no longer an experimental weapon, uh, all rapier marshals, uh, depending on the kingdom, but in Osteora, uh now must be able to inspect rapier spears and uh, marshal uh, bouts with the rapier spear. Um, you have to be able to report adverse events. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is what we used to call the injury report or whatever. Um, they, they're, it's more specifically called the adverse events or adverse events report uh, in the new uh, handbook. Uh, and this, that's at the society level. Uh, so uh, adverse events um, are not well de defined. It's one of the more ambiguous par parts of the new manual, but it does include uh, tip failures, which a lot of people didn't really, didn't really report tip failures that much, uh, but uh, also weapon failures, of course, which we always reported, injuries, which were always reported, uh, and uh, armor failures, uh, that are out of the normal. Uh, of course, we used to consider fit tip failures normal, but uh, they now want uh, tip failures reported. Uh, and this was in a discussion with the society rapier marshal that we, we talked about this. So, uh, and, and remember, this is just for tracking. So no, you make sure that everybody knows that this isn't, we're not reporting adverse events because we want to find people to hunt down um, or as a witch hunt. Uh, it's really just tracking. We want to we want to find out what brand of tip and how old the tip was, and how you know you know about how it failed that sort of thing, so that we can get an idea of how to make things better. Really, um, and then finally, the biggest one of the biggest things to, for me is loaner gear. If you're going to be a, a local rapier marshal, you have to be able to bring loaner gear. Uh, now you could have a, a loaner gear deputy, uh, that's, that's not uncommon, uh, or even split up the job between yourself and, and several other uh, deputies that are responsible for the loaner gear, but it should be available, accounted for, and well-maintained. The nice thing about having a loaner gear deputy is that while you're worried about inspections and uh, the waivers and those sorts of things, uh, your loaner gear deputy can be allowed, can be worried about accountability and getting all the loaner gear back that you bring. Uh, so, and you're also re responsible for submitting requests to your local financial committee uh, for replenishment of loaner gear. Okay, so local events. This is a big one. Remember, when you are the local branch rapier marshal or fencing marshal, which is the term we're using now, uh, you are the default marshal in charge. If no one else is assigned as the marshal in charge, you are the marshal in charge. Let's take that a step further. If no one, if someone is assigned as marshal in charge, by the Seneschal for that event, and they don't show up, then you become the marshal in charge. You should be very much involved in the process of ensuring that there is an MIC at your event. Now, does this mean that you have to go to every event? It does not. 
there are going to be times where you have life situations that keep you from making it to even your local group's event, and that's fine. But you should be very, you should know who is going to be the marshal in charge. And you should also know who is going to be the backup marshal in charge in the event that that person cannot make it. And you have to be sure that both of those people know that they are expected to fulfill those obligations. Um, but if nobody else shows up and if there's nobody else assigned, then you're the person running the rapier and CNT activities at your local events. So what does that mean? Uh, first of all, it, it means that you should be publishing armor inspection times and locations. Even if somebody else is the marshal in charge, and if they, if they haven't agreed to make sure that those things get published, then it's your job to make sure they get published. Even if they've agreed, you should, you should constantly check up on this and be at all the planning meetings. Um, because people want to know when they have to get up and when they have to get breakfast and when they have to get in their armor and out to the field for inspection. Um, people, people don't want to wonder about that. Um, so make sure those things get published uh, in all of the right places on the internet, in the event, um, in the event listing uh, or the event calendar, all those things. So make sure those things get published. Um, you need to make sure that the tournament and melee formats are published ahead, ahead of time as well. Why is that important? Well, people often don't bring all of their weapons that they have. They may not bring that nice, you know, melee shield if they didn't, if they don't realize that there's no melee at the event. Uh, they may not bring um, their buckler because they just dislike buckler so much they don't bring it unless they know that it's going to be a Swiss five that requires buckler at some point. Uh, or if you've got some weird format, especially where every round is either buckler or case, you want to let people know that ahead of time so they know what kind of weapons to expect and, and what to be ready for uh, when they show up. Uh, so it's your job if it's your job to make sure, even if it's somebody else's job technically, to at least make sure that they did their job and that the word gets out ahead of time. You have you are responsible for coordinating for a list steward, often called the list mistress, uh, field marshals, uh, and list heralds beforehand. Now, the the local um, your local herald it may be traditional for them to handle all of the heralding requirements. That's fine. Don't just assume that it's happening. Coordinate with them and make sure that they are that they actually understand that tradition and that they agree to follow that tradition many many sca traditions are things that happened once and everyone thinks it's a tradition so don't make any assumptions about those things coordinate for for list steward field marshals and list heralds beforehand um, even if it's just delegating to somebody else like the local herald and then finally, uh, coordinate for the field setup. Don't assume that there's some setup group or setup crew that just knows how your field's gonna get set up. Uh, plan to either be there or have a deputy there or somebody that you trust there uh, to make sure that the list field is set up prior to armor inspection. Um, people don't like to come to your events if they have to show up and set all your stuff up for you. So make sure that stuff gets set up beforehand, even the night before. None of this thing, none of this stuff is fun. Like, you know, we'd all rather just be um, fencing or, or out in our backyards, you know, at the Pell constantly or training. I know I would, but um, when you take on the obligation of that local rapier marshal position, um, you're making sure that other people uh, can really enjoy your group's event. Any questions so far before I move on? No? Okay, good. Perfect. And if you do have any questions, go ahead and put them in, in the chat. 
uh, uh, Katarina is, is monitoring the chat. So, okay, local events uh, during the event. Uh, so, some things to remember that you're responsible for during the event. Inspection and setup of the field. We already went over setup, but definitely inspection of the field. And this, this includes inspecting uh, possibly Friday night when you get to the event, and then even Saturday morning or Saturday just before the event happens, um, if, if the, if, or before the, the list is opened. Uh, if you have a tournament that's going to be run after a chivalric tournament, it's, it's pretty common that some parts of that field may have gotten uh, damaged in such a way that they cause a hazard for your fencers. So inspecting the field just before the tournament is very important. And making sure that your field marshals for each of those uh, list fields is, are also inspecting. Um, conducting armor inspections. Um, this should include looking for their authorization card. Make sure that everybody has an authorization card or make sure there's a system in place for making it. Some people, sometimes the list steward will handle the authorization cards and site tokens. Uh, so you'll get your armor inspection and then they will go to the list to sign up and the list steward will check authorization card and site token. Sometimes that the reason that makes sense is because when you're being inspected for your armor, you're putting your mask on, uh, you've got your weapons in your hands, you're kind of handling them around and it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of awkward to pull out uh, these, these official documents like your authorization paperwork and site tokens. So sometimes it makes sense to have your list mistress uh, check those things. Um, and then arrange for others to assist with the inspections beforehand. Um, we, we all know that if we, if we especially in Onstiora, uh, other kingdoms are different. I, I know I started in Meridies. Uh, at the time I was in Meridies, much more difficult process to become a field marshal than Onstiora's process. But in, in Onstiora, you know, we usually have a pretty good ratio of field marshals to non-field marshals around. So people sort of assume that there's gonna be a lot of people to assist with armor inspections. Uh, but just in case, um, you know, arrange with a few people, especially from the local group to come out and assist with it. So you're not depending too much on, on others. Um, you should always conduct a safety brief uh, beforehand. The, um, the biggest thing is to go over any of the weird outlier rules, uh, including things like death from behind, if there's going to be in, any spears involved, um, you know, any, you know, because it's a non-standard weapon, any um, experimental weapons that might be involved. Uh, if it's going to be a weird mixed tournament, like you have CNT rounds and non-CNT rounds, or if you have any strange offhands, anything anything that's sort of out of the ordinary that needs that really needs to be gone over and go over what your mitigating factors are for those. If you're, you know, if you've got uh, some weird uh, thing that's going to be on the field, well, you know, we've got three marshals per field uh, to make sure that that doesn't do the thing. Same thing with likely hazards. You know, if you've got some weird hazards or some slippery spots, uh, maybe you've you've posted a marshal in one of those slippery spots that's just going to stand there and make sure nobody hits it. Especially, that's very common in melees. I'm sure a lot of people have seen that in melees. So you should go over all of those things. And and when you have those things like a marshal standing in a weird spot, let everybody know that that's happening. Um, and give your conduct your safety brief in a way that everybody listens. Uh, it's quite frequent that you conduct this safety briefing and, you know, you've got people that are straggling in or people that are out in the middle of nowhere and not really paying attention to it. And then they're trying to get up to speed after the fact. Um, you know, I'm a pretty oblivious guy. I, I quite often don't get the safety briefing <laughs> from people. Um, so, you know, make sure that everybody gets that safety briefing. One of the things, this is um, just my own sort of uh, uh, technique that I use for uh, for hazards. I, I classify hazards into uh, those things uh, on the field that I should tell people about, um, those hazards that I should mark either with a human being or a flag or something like that, and then those hazards 
finally that are going to just make that field unusable. So it might be, you know, it might go from, hey, uh, there's some loose leaves over here. Everybody pay attention for those to, um, you know, there's a depression in the ground over here that could that could take somebody's leg out. I'm going to place a marshal there to uh, we've got, you know, a 40 foot trench that's been dug overnight in the middle of the field. We're not going to be able to use it. So I, you know, I, I break down my hazards into those three categories when I'm looking for them. So, um, you know, pay attention to that in your safety brief. Um, you have to be ready to handle disagreements off the field. Remember, a marshal is not a, uh, an official or official, he's not an officiating marshal or a point calling marshal. Uh, SCA marshals are just safety officers. So if two combatants have a disagreement about, um, whose shot landed first, or whether or not a strike was valid, that is not an agreement that you solve. You simply ask the dead man to say he is dead. And if, if no one is willing to say that they are dead and they are unwilling to refight the match or to let, or in the instance of a melee to just let it go, then you have to be ready to ask people to take that off of the field. Now, if you're the marshal in charge, more than likely it's gonna be one of your field marshals that, um, that encounters this and they're going to have to escalate it to you. So make sure that all of your field marshals know that as soon as something like that comes up, it needs to be escalated to your level so that you can solve the disagreement. Now, if it's a disagreement over blows, quite often we'll take that disagreement to whoever the principals of the tournament are, which might be the baron and baroness of the local group, or um, the king and queen, or if the crown is, or if the, the, the prince and princess are there, uh, we may escalate it to them. If it's a, um, if it's a, a disagreement over, um, over a safety situation, or over whether or not somebody should even be on the field, then that needs to be either taken to a marshal's court, in which case you would bring all of your field marshals together, uh, decide whether the person should stay in or whether you just give them a verbal warning. Uh, and then all of those things would then be listed on an adverse event report. See how I segued into that? Pretty nice, huh? Uh, an adverse event report and sent up uh, to your uh, to your boss now uh, whether it's a regional or a kingdom level office now here's the thing with uh, adverse er event reports at events um, you will want to make sure that you not just send up the report but you probably want to call up uh, your direct boss who that report is going to and and let them know that hey you're about to get this thing um, sorry uh, but not sorry, because I'm reporting like I should. Um, so that brings us to the next um, thing to think about, uh, collecting adverse event reports. Um, injuries, uh, anything that involves experimental uh, weapons should definitely be reported up if it's, if it's adverse. Uh, weapon and armor failures, uh, we just discussed this with the, with the society, uh, fencing marshal uh, who uh, has decided that even tip failures should be reported as adverse events. Um, just like on the local practice, just like we said on local practices, make sure everybody knows this isn't a finger pointing exercise or a blame assignment exercise. This is merely us collecting data to make the thing that we do better in the future. That's all it is. It's just a data collection effort. And so finally, something that's not on here that I wanted to go over. Um, remember that as the marshal in charge, uh, you cannot compete in the tournament or in the melee. Um, 
The main reason for that is because if there is a disagreement between yourself and somebody else in that tournament or that melee, there may be no one else on site to ask for or escalate that disagreement to. Now, occasionally, and this is not the rule, this is um, the opposite of the rule, but occasionally there will be uh, a kingdom officer there or a regional officer uh, who is willing to maybe not be the marshal in charge, but willing to take any escalations that involve you directly. Uh, you should never make that assumption. You should work that out with them. Um, there, there's nothing in the there's nothing in the society rules forbidding that that sort of an escalation from happening. It's still a bad place to get into, though. Uh, I I generally say if you're going to be the marshal in charge, don't compete in the tournament or the melee. If you want to compete in the tournament or the melee, convince another warranted officer to be the marshal in charge. Any questions about local events in the chat at all? Nothing? Okay. Then after the event, um, remember to, this is, this is just uh, be, be kind to the people that have helped you get where you are. Um, clean up all of the equipment that you take there or that you use, tables, that sort of thing, and help clean up the field. Um, get your, your reports submitted and then for the love of God, thank everybody that helped. Um, do not neglect uh, thanking those people uh, who have helped you um, do a wonderful job at your event. Okay, um, next responsibility or, or area of responsibility is reporting. Um, depending on the kingdom that you're in, and since this is a this is more of a society level, um, uh oh, I've got somebody that's trying that's waiting to get in. I just saw them. Hold on, admit them in. Okay. Hey, Orlando, uh, you have a question. Do you want me to ask now or wait? Yes, bring it up. Okay. Do you have a recommendation on water bearing at events or I might have missed it? Um, not something I intended to cover in this, um, but because water bearing is usually um, managed by the event itself. So normally, because there's so many tournaments um, that, are, that, that are for chivalric tournaments, there's rapier tournaments, there's, there's gonna be um, you know, spectators that need water bearing, there's gonna be um, archery, uh, all kinds of outdoor activities that require water bearing. Water bearing is usually handled by the event stewards. So what I would recommend though, is that you make sure to coordinate beforehand with your water bearing steward or whoever is handling water bearing and make sure that they know uh, when things start and where you're gonna be. This is especially important if you're in some weird spot. This, ha this happens a lot of times where, um, you know, for whatever reason, because of the format of your melee or the format of the tournament, it doesn't happen right on the list field. And so, so yeah, it is, it is actually a good idea to coordinate with water bearing beforehand. And what I mean by beforehand is, is possibly well before the event starts and make sure that they know, hey, we're gonna be in this weird spot or whatever. Uh, but if you're on the event schedule, uh, you know, water bearing should know to be there. Um, you know, same thing with, with all of everything that's on the event schedule. So, but yeah, it's a good idea to coordinate with them. It's a good question. Anything else? No? Okay. So uh, reporting, uh, depending on your kingdom, you're gonna have different reporting requirements. Uh, some of your reporting requirements may be monthly, quarterly. Uh, you've got your waiver submissions. Uh, for instance, in, in Onsteora, waiver submissions all go through the Seneschal, who then uh, submits them to the waiver secretary. Um, in some cases, uh, depending on who the, the Earl Marshal is and depending on who the Kingdom Seneschal and all kinds of other combinations of offices, they may change the policy on that pretty frequently. So make sure you understand uh, who is supposed to get your waivers from your local practices. Remember at events, um, you shouldn't have to worry about waivers at events 
If they have a site token, that means their waiver has been verified at the gate already. So that's so if they have a site token, if they have verification that they have paid um, and and um, and gated into site, then you shouldn't have to check waivers at events, uh, just authorizations. Um, adverse event reporting. This is very important. Uh, remember, if it's an equipment failure, you want to get as much of information about the equipment as possible, uh, the manufacturer, uh, the date the equipment was used, about how long it's been used. If you can get information about, you know, um, how, the, you know, the frequency that it's been used, that sort of thing. And, and, and even better than all of that, too, is if, oh, let me let somebody else in, people coming in really late. Uh, if you can get some um, pictures of the uh, of the failure of the equipment failure uh, for injuries, uh, I do not recommend getting pictures of people people's injuries. Uh, there could be um, uh, you know medical um, privacy concerns with that. So uh, I would not um, I would avoid getting pictures of injuries of any sort. Uh, I know it sounds like a neat thing, but but you could have you could run into medical privacy issues. Um, but I would, re but remember with the injuries, when you report them, that's one thing. You're reporting the details of the injury. Uh, the other thing is that when the injury occurs, uh, you need to make sure that that you get them the proper uh, medical attention as soon as possible, uh, which which could be anything from uh, first aid care that can be applied right there on site up to uh, calling in an ambulance. Um, reporting at the local business and populace meetings. Uh, depending on your local group, they may want you to stand up in front of the populace and give a report on all the great things that have happened uh, in the, the fencing and rapier community uh, within, the, within the local group. Uh, this could include uh, everything from just how everybody did an event to who got some recent uh, recognition, like maybe somebody that got their Queen's Rapier or people that have won tournaments, those sorts of things. So, so in some ways, uh, uh, as far as the local business and populist meetings, it's a good chance for you to really um, beat the drum and, and get some good news out there about uh, what's going on with fencing and, and rapier locally. And then, uh, and then finally, uh, publications, making sure that, you're, that you've got the, the latest and greatest uh, set of publications. Remember, that it's not just uh, the society handbook, but it's also your local kingdom handbook that supplements it. And then any society supplemental uh, policy letters that have come out or changes that have come out, as well as any kingdom level changes that have come out. So those are all things that you have to be aware of. Okay, a couple of implied ancillary responsibilities that I sort of wanted to go over. Um, you should be ready to assist newcomers. Uh, this, you know, in, in some ways being the local rapier marshal can really distract from your training at your local practice. Uh, so, so you really have to, but you have to remember that when, a, when newcomers show up, uh, you're, you're a warranted officer of your local group as well. And so in that capacity, it's, it's really your obligation to be the hospitaler for those newcomers. Uh, so, so if you're lucky enough to have lots of newcomers showing up, you, you may also be unlucky enough to not get, get a whole lot of training. So um, some things to avoid when, when this comes about is don't plan as the local rapier marshal to give a whole bunch of classes at the local practice. But it is nice if you can arrange for other people to do that. Um, but you want to keep yourself freed up so that you can handle uh, any newcomers that come in uh, and, and, you know, either, either put them with the right people that can, that can help them uh, get started, uh, you know, or just sort of, you know, talk them through what's going on. Some people, their first practice they show up to, they just want to observe. So, you know, give them, give them the option to do that. Uh, don't don't make pe people feel bad because they didn't get out there and jump out there and just start fighting. Um, drop testing and uh, map test or mass testing. Uh, you should be 
um, available. You should have a drop tester available. You can find the plans for that in the uh, uh, Society Fencing Marshals Handbook, uh, or you can buy them at certain vendors online, uh, but this is for testing people's armor. Uh, does that mean you're going to test everybody's armor that shows up? No, we don't, we don't want to put holes in everybody's armor or, or either even dimples, but people will show up uh, with armor that they want tested, and so you need to be ready to test that for them. And that's the same thing with mask testing. You have to be ready with that uh, 15 kilogram uh, spring-loaded um, punch tester is usually uh, what's recommended. Um, and then uh, assigning deputies to assist. Um, if, you, if you have the capacity to do this, uh, this will help you out a lot if you can find people to help with the different responsibilities. Uh, have a waivers deputy, have a, um, a loaner gear deputy, have a, a newcomer's deputy if, if, if you want to. And some, in some cases, these, these people don't even, you know, some of your deputies don't even have to be authorized uh, field marshals. They could just be people that do ancillary jobs for you. So, so be ready to assign deputies. Um, Ensure that your deputies have current martial authorizations. Of course, these are the deputies that have to, um, you know, conduct armor inspections and those sorts of things. Also ensure that anyone that's field marshaling at your practices and events have current martial authorizations. That means hunting down an authorizing marshal and either having them come help um, authorize some of your local fencers or uh, throwing a bunch of people in the back of the car and, and dragging them somewhere to get authorized. Um, also advising the, the Seneschal and the Baron and Baroness. This is an important um, job. You need, to, you need to be ready to, to let them know um, if the field configuration is not going to work in an event or at a demo, or let them know if you would like them to come help with um, setting up a mock tournament. We all, we do a mock tournament twice a year locally, and we usually will have V's and Foyers B&B come in for one, and then Namron's B&B come in for the other. Uh, and we just do that at practice. And that sort of, it's sort of to get some of our newcomers over the threshold of uh, showing up to a tournament uh, without having to go to an event and a tournament. Um, requesting new loaner gear. Uh, you should be very familiar with what your financial policy's position is on loaner gear. Uh, some, some groups, uh, each officer has a budget they can spend every year. Um, some groups have uh, a lots of, of uh, hoops and hurdles and ceremony that you had to go through to get loaner gear. Uh, you should get yourself familiar with, you know, talk with your local exchequer and see what their um, what the local financial policy is and what you have to do to request loaner gear. Also remember that any loaner gear you buy, you then have to haul around. So uh, be aware of that. And you should buy the stuff that you, you think you really, really need uh, that's important, which is gonna be different from group to group. Some groups are gonna, are gonna need more weapons. Some groups are gonna need more masks. Um, I know uh, gloves are always a big one. People people often show up and they don't have enough gloves and they're, they're also cheap to get a, Get a bunch of gloves on on Amazon or eBay or something like that that, that work fine. Um, the um, if you if you if you want to know a really if you want a really good glove on Amazon, let me know uh, on Facebook or some other method, and I can I can point you to one that's not a um, I hate the I, I really hate when I see groups that have the the um, welding gloves because they're they're really not good gloves to fence in. And there, there are actually decent gloves you can get out there for around seven, eight bucks a pair uh, with good gauntlets. Um, and then uh, arranging your, the locations for local practices that, you know, some, some areas uh, it may make sense to have good indoor practice space uh, because the, the weather is, you know, you're either, it's either extremely hot in the summer or extremely cold in the winter and uh, rains a lot, whatever. Uh, some areas, you know, an outdoor space is just fine, but it's, it's going to be your job to arrange that space and work with um, whoever owns that space, uh, whether, it's a, whether it's a public park or, or some community center or a church or something like that to make sure that you can uh, have it on a regular basis.
Okay. Not too bad. We're about a little less than 10 minutes away from, uh, from eight. So I'm going to open up the floor for questions or discussion. So if there are any uh, questions, feel free to either put them in the chat or we've got a few enough people here. I think we can, uh, you can unmute yourself and, and uh, give us your question. Anybody? What do we have in chat? Um, still water bearing. Yeah, there are new, no new questions in chat, sorry. <laughs> okay, well great, I did such a great job. I answered everybody's questions already. You did. Amazing. <laughs> okay. This is pretty great, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, post, we'll post the video here uh, shortly. Um, and um, so yeah, so I, okay, well hey, I appreciate it, everybody, uh, and uh, it was good seeing everyone and having everyone in, um, participate in our class and uh, continue to support the um, Academy of the Rapier, the Virtual Academy of the Rapier. Uh, I know uh, this is the uh, Virtual Academy of the Service-Minded Individuals, but uh, look for some of my classes up there. I'm giving a class, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, on uh, Guy Windsor's uh, flow uh, theory. Uh, so it uh, should be a really interesting class. See, I did that quick plug there, Kat. <laughs> He's yeah. also going to be teaching a class for uh, the Virtual Academy of Service-Minded Individuals with Master Etienne about the duties of the Kingdom Rapier Marshal. So if you're interested in that, keep an eye out for that. Yeah, we're working. We're working on that right now. So there should be more to follow. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Everybody have a great evening. Take care, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.